Okay. So um, today we're going to prove homological stability for surfaces. So we uh, proved homolo or for configurations of spaces of surfaces. We proved uh, homological stability for um, configuration spaces of, po of points in R2 last time, and then we'll uh, today prove it uh, for orientable surfaces. And then I'll sort of talk a little bit about uh, how to prove it for general manifolds. Again, like everything here is um, non-compact. And then, um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so recall, so if you have a non-compact manifold, so you can think of the interior of a compact manifold with, with non-empty boundary. Um, you know, there's a stabilization map where you glue on a collar uh, onto your manifold and then you can add a point in that collar because you're guaranteed to not have any points. And then this procedure of gluing on a collar doesn't change the homeomorphism type. So, um, you know, I guess there should be another picture where you sort of apply a homeomorphism to the configure to the manifold, and, you know, in the configuration to um, identify this, uh, you know, torus with a uh, collar attached with the original torus. So the, you know, the net effect of this map is it sort of pushes all of the points away from the boundary and then adds one point in the you know region where there aren't any points. And then the um, the theorem due to Graham Siegel from the 1970s says that um, this this map induces an isomorphism on homology uh, for i sufficiently small compared to k. So if this configuration space is a manifold and its dimension is growing with k. And it says, you know, that um, in some range, uh, the homology doesn't depend on k. Um, so, you know, as like k increases, you should just think that like, well, the dimension grows and the high dimensional homology changes, but eventually the high dimensional homology, um, you know, groups become constant. Okay, yeah, so our goal today is to prove the theorem with the additional assumption that's an orientable surface. And then I'll, I'll sketch what you need to do um, more more generally. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I guess I. This terrible history. Okay. Um, And there's an apostrophe there or something. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so last time what we did was we proved the theorem in the case uh, that the, the manifold is R2. And this is originally due to, um, to Arnold. I think I've heard Russian people pronounce it like Arno or something. Um, and I think I got the apostrophe in the correct place. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, last time we proved homological stability in the case of R2, and then the, the goal today is to leverage that uh, to prove it in the case of general manifolds. Any questions? Oh yeah, there are some, um, story that I don't know, but that Benson Farb loves about like how this has something to do with solving um, polynomial equations or something. Okay. So uh, yeah, so we're gonna need the, the, the following um, lemma, which um, yeah, so like in Graham Siegel's paper, he just sort of states this without um, without justification. Um, one of my co-authors wrote up like a rigorous proof of it. Um, yeah, but you know, it should be obvious in the case that M is a surface. So the statement is that, that if you have, or you know, if M is a, let's see, a finite type surface. Um, yeah, so it says that if you have a manifold, there is a CW, a sub CW complex X 
of your manifold of dimension n minus one. So you have an n manifold, and then you have this, um, base, you know, basically an n minus one skeleton, such that the uh, the complement is homeomorphic R n, so that you know, you can write your manifold as a union of a of R n and something n minus one dimensional. So you know the picture in the case of the torus. Um, I guess these aren't, you know, the, I mean, this X isn't unique, but um, yeah, so if you think of sort of, you know, torus with boundary, you, you can take this um, blue graph here, and the complement is, um, is going to be homeomorphic to R2. And, you know, if you say, like, oh, I have trouble visualizing. Um, visualizing it sort of in 3D, you can just view the torus as an identification surface. And so what's the, um, what graph do we want? Well, we want the, um, the boundary of the square to be X, and then we want one line, you know, so uh, if, if, we, if I didn't have the black circle, yeah, I don't know, so look, I guess the torus. So um, if I didn't have the, the black circle, this identification surface would give you uh, the closed torus, but I cut out a, a disk, so now we get the torus with one boundary. And then uh, in the one skeleton, we also need a line connecting the um, um, the, the, the boundary of the square to the, um, the boundary. Yeah, so I think, you know, if you think of like a 4G gone minus some disks, what would you do? Well, you just take the boundary of the the 4G gone and then add lines connected to the disk, and that would be your n minus one skeleton whose complement is R2. Any any questions? And it's not a hundred percent obvious how to do this in general, or even you know, like if I had an infinite genus surface, uh, you know, how to do this. There are lots of different, um, you know, homeomorphism types of infinite genus surfaces, and you know, anyone you write down, like, it's not that hard to. Just say it explicitly, but how to prove that X exists in general, you know, might not be completely clear. Okay. So um, we're going to define. Oh yeah. So you know, the the general strategy is going to be the same as as last time. So we're we're going to uh, filter the configuration space by, or you know, we're gonna we're gonna filter some space by. Uh, closed or open subspaces, and then the filtration differences will be things that we understand inductively, and then we'll have some compactly supported cohomology argument and induction, and um, the theorem will pop out. And so the, yeah. Um, okay, so what, what's our, you know, this time we're not gonna deal with uh, symmetric products, we're just gonna filter the configuration space and um, what 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 do you do? You, um, you know, what was the point of this X? Well, we're going to filter the configuration space by how many points are in X. So we're going to, you know, I guess this this space here, you know, depends on X. But I didn't want to clutter the notation, so yeah. So just um, conf k superscript d means we've got at least d points in x and k total points. Another picture. So um, yeah. So conf k d is a, is a closed subspace because you know like x is a closed subspace of M and the uh, the filtration differences. So if you're if you have um, configurations space of k points and d of them, 
at least d of them are an x, but d plus one of them are not an x, then that means you have exactly d and x, and you have um, k minus d in the complement of x, which is rn. Eventually, we'll specialize to n equals 2. Um, but basically, everything general, you know, works in general other than, um, yeah, well, I guess I'll talk about that later. OK. And any questions? Oh, yeah, I guess. Um, well, I don't know. So I guess when, when I first read, um, you know, this, these arguments in Siegel's paper, I sort of felt like I could locally, like, understand each line, but I had no idea what the big picture was. Um, is this how, like, most people feel or people more confused than that or less confused or... Um, like especially about the yesterday's class because today's class is going to be, or, you know, the argument today is going to be very similar to the argument last time. I did feel that way last time. You felt like oh, like you said like like every like, like things individually made sense, but like what's the big picture? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, this is sort of. Yeah. I mean the. And, you know, I mean, the big picture is just we're going to chop, chop a space up into smaller pieces. And then, um, yeah, so last time the, the big picture was we chopped up a space into small pieces. And all of the pieces, either by induction we understood, or uh, the only piece that we didn't understand by induction was this symmetric product of R2. But that, that piece was just, um, you know, homeomorphic to uh, r to the 2k, so stability for that was obvious. And we're going to do something similar here. We're going to chop it up into pieces. And like, um, I guess here we're chopping it up. You know, we're interested in this, con or, you know, we're, we're interested in this space in a better color. Yeah. We're interested in this space, and so we're going to filter it. And then, um, to under to understand this sp space, uh, like uh, you know, we just need to understand. Uh, I, I guess like when you write down a filtration, to under um, yeah, I, I guess so. We're writing this as a union of these subspaces, and then the differences um, are these spaces. So to prove stability for the space for this space. We just need to prove stability for these spaces. And then, um, yeah, so then today, you know, so um, I guess last time, last time we proved stability for, for um, configurations in Rn. So that's something we sort of basically understand. And then today we just need to sort of prove stability for configurations of points in X. And the idea is going to be that because X is lower dimensional and we're using compactly supported cohomology, we sort of um, cheaply get stability here. So that's sort of the strategy. We're interested in the thing with the red arrow and then to like under, you know, using compactly supported cohomology in this filtration to understand the thing with the red arrow pointing to it, we just need to understand the blue and the purple and the light blue we did yesterday. And then the purple I'm going to talk about um, soon. Uh, hopefully that, I don't know, gives some sort of big picture. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so the nice thing about long exact, co uh, the nice thing about compactly supported cohomology is if you're interested in the compactly supported cohomology of a space and you write it as the union of two spaces, one of which is open, the other is closed, then you get this long exact sequence. So um, basically, if you know, um, you can study a space by writing it as the you know the union of open sets or closed sets, um, and then you study the iterated differences of the closed sets. Yeah. So we're going to apply this in the case of um, 
you know, this configuration space of k, k points where d of them are in um, um, yeah, so I guess this will be x um, this is u and then this is x minus u so, you know um, our closed subspace will be configuration space of points where d plus one of them are in x. That's closed in the configuration space where d of them is in x. And then the open the open complement of that closed set is this. So, um, you know, by induction we can assume that we know. I guess we're going to start the induction when. We're start the induction when D is when um, we're like doing induction on D and we're going to start when D is K. So by induction, um, by induction, we're going to, that was terrible. Yeah. By induction, we'll know about the pink thing. We'll know stability for the pink thing. And then um, by by last class, we know something about the blue thing, and then all I need to do is tell you about the red thing, and then we'll get the information about the gray, the thing with the gray arrow. So, you know, induction tells us about the, the pink, the purple, I don't know, it's violet maybe, um, the violet group. So the violet group stabilize, the um, blue group stabilize, we're interested in the the gray groups, and so we just need to understand the, the red groups a little bit better. Um, yeah, so that's the, the first strategy. So, you know, it's similar to last time. I think it's slightly easier than last time, even because last time we had like these induction, two different induction hypotheses that were sort of interacting, and one of them had two variables. Uh, so, yeah, here we're just pr proving stability and we're inducting. I guess we're inducting over, I don't even know if we're inducting over K. We're definitely inducting over D. Okay. Yeah, so this slide summarizes things. So, um, oh yeah, so I mean, I guess, uh, I know it doesn't summarize what I said. Um, yeah, so the point of the slide is we're saying that, you know, if M is an orientable manifold, then the configuration space, or it's an orientable even dimensional manifold, then the configuration space is going to be a, um, Manifold, so to prove the homology of the configuration space stabilizes, it suffices to prove that the compactly supported cohomology stabilizes. Um, yeah, because this Poincare duality gives us that um, this group is isomorphic to that group, and this group is isomorphic to that group by Poincare duality, so we just need to show this equal sign to prove that equal sign. Yep, similar to last time. Okay. And so then the, um, uh, what's happening on this slide? So, um, yeah, so the, the stabilization map, you know, this is something we talked about on Tuesday. This stabilization map doesn't induce a map on compactly supported cohomology because the, the only kinds of maps that induce maps on compactly supported cohomology are, uh, at least that I'm aware of, are, are proper maps, which induce maps um, one way, and then um, open embeddings, which induce maps the other way. So this stabilization map isn't a, um, doesn't induce a map on compact support cohomology. So what we do is we cross the domain with Rn uh, to make this an open embedding, because, you know, that will make the um, manifold the same dimension. So, um, yeah, so if you ignore X, what do we do? We just have a map from the configuration space. Um, oh yeah, there's even a typo. I forgot to have superscript these. We get, you know, there's a map from the configuration space of K points in M across Rn to the configuration space of K plus one points in M, where what you do is you embed, basically, what this comes from is you, you have M And then you um, you can think of it as you can think of it as we're um, we're embedding M cup R N into into M, 
And then this is giving us a map from like conf km cross conf1 rn into conf k plus 1m. And then conf1 is just rn. Yeah, so th this stabilization map here. Yeah, so that, I mean. Uh, the, the the nice thing about about non-compact manifolds is they they have self embeddings that aren't aren't homeomorphisms. Um, so you know the red region is homeomorphic to the entire manifold. Um, so you just pick an embedding of your manifold, disjoint union Rn into your manifold. That'll induce a map on configuration spaces. And then I'm claiming basically that we can pick, um, you know, this is this map capital T, and I'm saying we can pick this in a way compatible with X. Um, yeah, so I mean, maybe it's territorially obvious. So yeah, so I'm saying that we get this. Um, Stable, you know, map homotopy equivalent to the stabilization map for these conf k uh, d's um, that induces a map on compactly supported cohomology. So here we want to show these two groups are isomorphic, but they're in different gradings. So um, so what we do is we just you know, basically cross, cross with Rn here, and then add an N there. Um, and now, you know, it's a map. Now the this number is equal to that number, and we have an open embedding of this space into that space. So it fixes both problems simultaneously. You know, and, and crossing with Rn has the effect of just shifting compactly supported cohomology. Okay, any any questions? Okay. Yeah, so summarize everything. We have the this you know this diagram. So um you know, initially we're interested in proving, uh, or you know, we want to prove that this is an uh, isomorphism in a range uh, for all D, and then we'll just um, yeah, and then um, yeah, because once once D is um, greater than or equal to K, uh, this sorry, once D is zero. This is just ordinary configuration space. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so we want to show this map's an isomorphism. Um, so, you know, it, homology is a homotopy invariant, so crossing with Rn doesn't change anything. So we want to just show this map's a isomorphism in a range. And then by Poincaré duality, that's equivalent to showing this map's an isomorphism in a range. And then, you know, if you want, you know, crossing with Rn just shifts um, compactly supported cohomology. Yeah, so the upshot is that our, you know, our goal, the mo you know, we started out being interested in the purple map, and that's equivalent to studying the red map. And any questions? Okay, so what is, yeah, so um, maybe let's back up and go to a few slides. So, so basically I'm gonna come, I'm gonna combine, I'll just say what this is. Okay, so, you know, remember that the, um, let's look at this side. So um, 
No, here. So, um, we're somehow like taking this to be u and this to be x, and then this is x minus u. Um, so we get a long exact sequence and compactly support cohomology. And you can do the same thing on the right um, and sort of, you know, the diagram commutes. So we're um, yeah, so um, yeah, so um, Basically, we're going to want to use the, the the five lemma and induction, and say you know, and assume by induction that we know you know, uh, induction will tell us that this map is an ISO in a range. We're going to want to know that this map is an ISO in a range, because you know we're we're doing downwards induction because when d is zero, this conf k d is just the configuration space. We're going to want to know that's an isomorphism in a range, so it's going to suffice to just understand uh, the green. Okay. Um, I thought these diagrams didn't run off the page. Uh, whatever, this slide's not that important. Okay. Yeah, so the first strategy, we're going to prove um, stability for you know, as k increases for comp kd by induction on d, the, um, you know, it'll begin in the case that k equals d. Um, and then we'll, um, um, so the main observation is that the uh, compactly supported cohomology of configurations of points in x um, vanishes in a range. And then, um, you know, we'll use a Kuna theorem to study the product. And then we'll use the long exact sequence, um, you know, and the five lemma. Okay. So, yeah, so I guess here, the, the um, uh, you know, the, these terms are products, or the homology of products. And so we talked about what crossing with Rn does, but we didn't talk about more general products. So um, that's sort of what Kuna tells you. So the, um, the usual Kuna theorem uh, says that there's a, there's a short exact sequence that goes from, uh, you know, so the, um, yeah, so you, you we want to know how does the homology of X cross Y compare to the homology of X and the homology of Y. And in good circumstances, it's just the, um, you know, the homology of X tensor the homology of Y in degrees that add up to the, the degree you're interested in. And then there's this um, sort of error term. Uh, and this error term goes away, you know, this Tor group vanishes if um, one of these homology groups is free. And, um, yeah, or if you're working over a field, then, you know, all modules over a field are free. So then this term vanishes. Uh, yeah, so what does this say? So, for example, the homology of a space cross a torus is just going to be, um, you know, the homology of the torus is z in degree zero, z squared in degree one, and um, z in degree two. So that'll tell you the homology of a space cross a torus is um, it's given by this. And so, you know, in this example, we don't have this error term because the homology of a torus is, um, is free. Any questions or... Um, does anyone think that I shifted the wrong way? Like, I believe this is plus one and plus two. I think I shifted the correct way because you plug in X as a point. Should get the right answer.
Okay. So, sort of, you know, uh, the corollary of the um, Lacuna theorem says that if you have a um, if you have a map, and so um, that's a surjection in degree n and an isomorphism in lower degrees, then uh, you know from a space x to y. Then if you cross that map with the identity from z to z, it's going to uh, induce an isomorphism in the same range. Uh, yeah. So, um, and similarly, um, if you know there's a, a version for pairs. So if you have, um, you know, a pair of A and B, and the the relative homology vanishes in a range, and a map from X to Y is an isomorphism in a range and a surjection in top degree, then you know. If you work it out, the Kuhner theorem will, will tell you that um, that the range in which uh, this map of pairs is a is an isomorphism is the you know is basically the or a surjection is the the range for from x to y plus the range of vanishing for a and b. And you know, there's also a Kuhner theorem for cohomology and for compactly supported cohomology. And um, we we got a, a, a corollary of the, um, the Kuhner theorem that says uh, compactly supported cohomology that if you have a map and it induces a, um, a surjection in degree n and uh, isomorphism in higher degrees, and then you have a space whose compactly supported cohomology um now I'm confused. Uh oh yeah, and the space is compactly supported cohomology vanishes above degree M, then um uh, then in like degrees N plus N above n plus m, you're going to have an isomorphism and you'll have a search action here. Um, yeah, so we're going to apply this in the case that like z is this configuration space of points um, in, the, in this one skeleton and x and y are configurations of points in Rn. Yeah, so What's the, the the idea? So the configuration space hunt D of X. So remember, let's go to another picture of X. Um, yeah. So your X is this um, one skeleton of the manifold with the property that the complement is. Or, you know, it's a co-dimension one skeleton with the property that the complement is a uh, is Rn. So in the surface case, it's a, it's a graph, and the complement is R2. Um, yeah, OK. So the uh, idea is going to be that configurations of points in X, you know, configurations of points in a surface, configurations of 10 points in a surface is going to be 20 dimensional, but configurations of 10 points in a graph is only going to be 10 dimensional because the graph is only one dimensional. Where are we? Um, oh, yeah. So the uh, so th this statement just says that the uh, so, you know, this configuration space is uh, D times n minus one dimensional because X is n minus one dimensional. So the compactly supported cohomology vanishes above this degree. You know, because X is going to have a compact vacation that's going to be a CW complex that's um, dimension E times N minus one. So the compactly supported cohomology is going to be, you know, the is going to vanish above this degree. And last time we proved that this map's an isomorphism. So the Kuhnert theorem is going to tell us that this map is some is an isomorphism in some range. Um, 
Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So, um, okay. So, this is going to give us the induction. Um, the induction induction step and I think I think I screwed up the induction beginning uh, you should just start the induction beginning when D is really big because when D is really big these things will be empty yeah, please remember let's remember the definition of Oh yeah, so this conf KD is a configuration space where we have, I think this, all the slides are, have been at least D points. Um, yeah, sorry, I forgot the definite. So uh, I meant to write, uh, we, have a, at, at, um, we have at least D points in X. And so if you send, um, if you send D to infinity, then conf KD, you know, once once D is larger than K, this configuration space is going to be um, is going to be empty. So then um, we'll get stability, uh, you know, maps from the empty set to the empty set are going to be isomorphisms in a range. So uh, so we'll get stability for these conf KDs um, for large D. Okay. So, yeah, so that, that's the induction beginning. Um, yeah, so now we're gonna prove, um, um, yeah, so by, by Induction, we know about induction, we know about this group. Um, the Kuna theorem and the fact that X is lower dimensional than the manifold tells, you know, the X is lower dimensional than M and our result in, um, for stability in the case, I guess, N is two tells us that this is an isomorphism in a range, and then the five lemma tells us that the middle map is an isomorphism in a range. And then, um, you know, once D is zero, this is just the usual configuration space. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the proof. Um, yeah. Any questions before I talk about, um, um, yeah. generalizations to the case that things aren't orientable or uh, higher dimensional. Oh yeah, maybe maybe let me just draw one picture. So um, yeah, so what what is it sort of saying? It's basically saying that so we're, we're trying to prove stability in a slope one half range and we already know that stability is um true in rn so um what what this is sort of saying is because x is co-dimension one that um that it, if you, in some sense, like if you, you know, if you care about what configurations are doing in a less than slope one range, you only need to sort of think about configurations in um, in our in the ball. So, like you know, you you could have. Um, 
Um, you know, the green point can go around um, the manifold. And that is, you know, in X, and that's a um, that's a, a class. This sort of uh, this loop gives you um, okay. Yeah. So, like, what what is homological stability about? Homological stability is about saying that like any fa any family of points moving around is equivalent to a, a family where at least one point is stationary, assuming the number of points is sufficiently large compared to the, um, the homological degree. So uh, stuff involving the manifold, stuff involving the manifold is like this, this purple loop and stuff using, um, Um, yeah, so, but the, uh, you know, and then this blue loop is something, a pattern involving points in R2. And so what, what this is saying is that, um, so, so, you know, like, why do we have a slope one half stable range? Well, this, um, this blue, this blue loop isn't in the image of the stabilization map, and it involves two points in a one-parameter family. So that's why there's a slope one-half in the stable range. Um, and then what this sort of argument involving the codimension one skeleton says is basically that if you have points interacting with the topology of the manifold as opposed to just the topology of Rn, that is only going to give you stuff in a slope one um, one range, so that's like well above the stable range. So, sort of the stability pattern for Rn governs what happens for configuration spaces. Maybe eventually how you should think about what happened. Uh, I don't know if this helped. Are there any questions? This is why I feel like I should never prove anything. Yeah, people seem to be more awake when I just like tell people facts as opposed to write down proofs. Okay. Uh, where are we? Oh yeah, so what, what we didn't do is we didn't do the case of higher dimensional manifolds or manifolds that aren't orientable. And also if, if you, um, the range, I, I promised you that the maps in isomorphism into when I equals K over two, and we only proved it was a surjection for i equals k over two. Like if you think about it, like why did why did we do that? Well, the five lemma. If you try to use the five lemma, you're only going to be able to prove like surjectivity in top degree. Like that's what that's the input and the output of the, I guess the four lemma versions of the five lemma, which is going to be give you the optimal results. Um, yeah, so let me sketch what to do for all of these three points. Um, so, you know, if the dimension of the manifold is odd or the manifold is not orientable, then the configuration space might not orient be orientable, might not be orientable. So you might not have, you know, one creative duality without twisted coefficients, but just use twisted coefficients. So there's some. Um, Um, some local system in on the um, on the manifold, you know, or some some bundle of abelian groups on the manifold, you know, or you can explicitly describe, I guess the what did I call it? The you can ex explicitly describe the orientation local system on a manifold and uh, on the, the configuration space in terms of the orientation local system on the manifold. It's something to do with um, um, the points and then you just sort of run the same proof but you have um, these local coefficients uh, everywhere and it doesn't change that much. 
Um, now, what about just sort of the, the fact that n is bigger than or equal to, to 2? Well, our proof used, um, you know, uh, what do I want to say? Oh, yeah. So our proof um, of stability for configurations of points in the manifold used stability for configurations of points in Rn. So we have to prove that. So what happened on Tuesday? On Tuesday, uh, our proof of um, stability for configurations of points in Rn used stability for compactly supported cohomology of symmetric products. So recall the symmetric product is just um, the kth power of a space mod the symmetric group. Um, so it's, you know, the it's like the subspace of the free abelian, free abelian monoid on X, where the sum of the labels is K. So, um, you know, these sim K RN spaces are, um, are contractible. So homological stability for these symmetric products is obvious. I mean, they're just contractible, so the um, maps are, you know, a map from a contractible space to another contractible space induces a isomorphism in all degrees, in on homology in all degrees. So if um, if these spaces were manifolds, then Poincaré duality would just immediately give stability for the compact and supported cohomology. But it turns out that these symmetric products, if you take the symmetric product of a of a manifold of dimension three or more, it's not a manifold. Like it's basically an accident that if you take the symmetric product of a um, of a surface for uh, a one manifold, you get out uh, a manifold. So you know, in in our case, in the case of when we only needed this in the case of the manifold was R two, and then there was this um, argument involving thinking about monic polynomials in terms of their roots and their coefficients, where we proved that you know, these sp the space was a, was a manifold. But for higher end, it's definitely not a manifold. So we can't just use Poincaré duality. So in fact, like even the homology of these spaces are completely boring. It's just z in degree zero. And um, you know, um, whatchamacallit? Um, zero and higher degrees. But the compactly supported cohomology of these spaces is is very non-trivial. Um, and yeah. OK, so maybe I'll say a little bit about that. So how would you compute compactly supported cohomology if you don't just have Poincaré duality? Well, what you do you know, is it's, it's isomorphic to pick your favorite comp compactification. You know, could be the one point compactification, could be another one. Uh, and then the compactly supported cohomology is just the cohomology of the compactification rel stuff you added. So um, here we're going to take a compactification that's not the one point compactification. So I'm just going to say, well, sim k rn lives in sim k sn. And um, um, and if you think about it, the, the complement is going to be uh, isomorphic to sim k minus 1 rn. Oh, sorry, sim k 1 sn. So how do we think about this? OK, so we got a sphere. Or we got a circle. Let's just say n is 1, we have a circle. This, is, this point is infinity. Need to write it out. Yeah, that points infinity, and then um, and then we have some some configurations. Wait, no, now I'm confused. This. Statement seems wrong. Um, oh, no, no, it's correct. OK. Uh, oh, yeah, and the, these points are all labeled by numbers when they add up to k. Um, so if you're, if you're not 
in the configuration space of um, you know, if you're in the configuration space of labeled points in SN, but you're not in the configuration space of labeled points in RN, you're going to need to have at least one point out at infinity. You might have more than one, but there's just going to be like a point labeled by one permanently um, you know, stuck out here. And then like the point labeled by seven can walk through that. And then like when it cross hits infinity, it's labeled by eight and then it leaves and it's labeled by seven again. Um, yeah, so, um, so it, you know, what it amounts to is we, if you want to understand the compactly supported cohomology of the symmetric product of Rn, you, you need to understand the relative homology of uh, sim Ksn rel sim K minus one SN. So basically you just need to compute the um, actual cohomology of uh, symmetric products of spheres. This is supposed to be a sphere. And this was completely uh, computed by um, Nakaoka in the fifties. Um, and you can just read off stability. And um, you know, these spaces are, are interesting because it turns out that, um, you know, the, that the limit as, as K tends to infinity of these spaces is actually a KZN. Um, so their you know, homology or cohomology is an important for um, cohomology operations. Uh, any questions? Yeah, so, so I mean, proof stability for configurations of points in, in all manifolds, and you know, when n is two, it's sort of, um, there, you know, there's sort of this geometric argument, but for a higher n, you do need this input, which is just um, like this explicit calculation of what uh, these, what these cohomology groups are. Okay. And then the, the, the last thing I owe you is, um, is injectivity in the top degree. And it turns out that, um, that the stabilization map is injective in, in all degrees. That's a theorem of, of Deuce and McDuff. So, you know, um, it's injective in all degrees, so stability in this context is just, you know, that's, it's surjective in a range. Um, so what, what do we want to do? You basically want to build a one-sided inverse. So you want a, a, a way of um, taking a homology class in the configuration space of k plus one points and building a homology class in the configuration space of k points. So um, yeah, so if the points were ordered, then, well, you can just say, okay, I'm going to, forget the k plus first point and get a map from the configuration space of k plus one points to the configure ordered configuration space of k points. But if they're, um, if they're, you know, here they're not ordered. So I don't know what like the k plus first point is. So if I want to forget a point, you know, there's no way to, or, you know, at least as far as I can tell, there's no way to just forget a point. What you can do is you can forget a point in all possible ways. I think this is a k plus one. So, yeah, so what does that mean? So I'm, I'm claiming that there's a map from the um, configuration space of k plus one points to the k fold symmetric product, k plus one fold symmetric product of the configuration space of of k points, and what it does is it forgets a point in all possible ways. So if you forget that point, we get this configuration. Forget this point, you get that configuration. If you forget this point, you get that configuration. And it doesn't go to the k-fold product because there, there's no way to order these. This is a, like a set, but it's not, I guess I wrote it as a tuple. I should have written, should have written like set brackets or something. Yeah, because it's a set, it's not a tuple. Or it's a multi-set, I guess. Here it'll actually be a set. Any, any questions?
for people who zoned out, they should pay attention to this because I think this is cute. Um, any? Yeah, so we can. Um, yeah, so we, you can't forget a point, but you can forget a point in all possible ways. Um, so you know we want we basically wanted a we want an inverse of the stabilization map. So the stabilization map brings in a point from infinity, and we want to sort of forget points. So we can't build a map to the configuration space, but we can build a map to this symmetric product. But now we're gonna um, uh, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna add up you know, homologies and Boolean groups so you can add. So um, oh yeah. Typo. So we have this map f that forgets a point. Uh, you can include the um, the symmetric product into the free abelian monoid. You know this is the configuration space of points in X, who's uh, labeled by uh, natural numbers, whose sum is k plus one. You can just view that as a subspace of the um, fr free abelian group. And then there are, um, a lot of typos on the slide. Um, oh no, right. Oh yeah, okay. So, um, there's a there's a, a map from the free abelian group on the free abelian group on a space to the free abelian group on the space. And what do you do? Well, an element of the free abelian group on the free abelian group on a space is a formal sum of formal sums of elements in your space, and just you add. So th this map is going to give us a map, in particular, from Z of sim of X, because you can think of sim K as a subspace of um, Z of X into Z of X. So now, um, so the so there's um, a map from the homology of the symmetric product of a space into, uh, you know, okay, so the the Dole-Tom theorem says that the homology of a space is the homotopy groups of the free abelian group on that space. So here we're applying, uh, we're applying the Dole-Tom con theorem to the symmetric product, so the homology is the homotopy groups of the free abelian group, and then um, and we apply this map on homotopy groups, and now we get back, uh, we get out an element of the free abelian group on X, because this is you know formal formal sums of formal sums maps to formal sums, and then we apply the Dole-Tom-Kahn theorem in in the other direction. Now where the space is X, not the symmetric product, and we get the homology. So the upshot is there's a natural map from the um, homology of the symmetric product of a space to the homology of a space. And what you should think of it is like, what's a chain in the symmetric product? Well, it's basically, you know, in the k-fold symmetric product of a space, it's basically k chains in your space. And chains are abelian groups, so you can just add them up. So that's what this composition is. So we're going to define a, the transfer map to be the composition, so you take a, and this is this one, this here. Um, you take a configuration of k plus one points, you forget uh, a point in all possible ways, and now you get a um, element of the symmetric product of the configuration space on one less points, and then in homology you can add. So this is a map on uh, chain comp or on homology groups, but it doesn't come from a map of spaces. Um, you know, and this is called the, the the transfer map. 
Any any questions? Yeah, so the, the transfer map is not a one-sided inverse of the stabilization map, but you can um, you can use it to build a one-sided inverse. So what, what is this picture saying? So th this, if we start out with a configuration of points in a manifold, you apply the stabilization map, you get one more point. Uh, you know, maybe this is our configuration. This is the stabilization of our configuration. Um, you know, so we, we wish that the transfer map were a one-sided inverse, the stabilization map, because that would show the stabilization map is injective. So we want, you know, and then you apply the transfer map and this whole thing, this whole thing is the um, transfer map of the stabilization map of a legible Greek letter, which is the name of our configuration. And we wished that this were the, um, we wished that this were just equal to a legible Greek letter. And it's not, but one of the terms is. Um, so it's, you know, it's almost true that the transfer map composed Post composed with a stabilization map is the identity. You know, this term gives us the identity, but then we have this error term. And then there's some argument that, um, you know, where you, you, you don't just use this transfer map, you use transfer maps where you forget two points in all possible ways, et cetera, and stabilization maps to write down a formula for the one sided inverse. So if you notice, uh, these two terms are in the image of the stabilization map because they have one point near the boundary. So these are actually in the image of, um, if you took a transfer map that forgot two points in all possible ways and then stabilized, that's what these two terms are. And you can so you can use more generalizations of the transfer map to write down you know, some sum that gives you a one-sided inverse of the stabilization map. Any, any questions? <laughs> 